Hi, my name is Misha, and I have a problem. I keep buying 172 scale diecast F4 Phantom models from Hobby Master. Although I do have uh, uh, one Century Wings and a Caliber, but I kind of found that Hobby Master is my sweet spot. Um, durability is really good. Prices well cheaper than caliber century what have you oh well and i picked up another one i just keep picking them up because there, there's interesting variations there's even a few i don't have i mean they're all similar but they're all different too i particularly like my uh japanese and israeli variants but of course i started off with u.s military air force navy but today, my new one is from the U.S. Marine Corps, USMC. And since I have it out, I brought out one I've actually had for maybe five years. Let's talk about the F-4B and the RF-4B. And I'll explain why I just I had to pick this one up when it came out late last year. And last time we looked at the Douglas and before that McDonald. I said we're going to be blending the two. Make you a deal. If this video gets a reasonable number of views and likes and shares, I don't expect it a miracle, but, you know, at least enough worthwhile. I'll do a big Phantom video. But as it stands, just thinking about doing the entire Phantom history makes me feel tired. So we're just going to keep it sweet and to the point. A little bit of a shorter video this go-round. So, the F4B. Or, as it was originally known, the F4H1. I really hope this doesn't fall during this video, but oh well. In for a penny, in for a pound. This was the first true production version of the Phantom. Or at least, it saw any type of actual combat theater use. What an interesting history. McDonnell actually came up with the idea kind of thinking about what the U.S. Navy and thus also the Marine Corps might want. But in the end, it was actually the Douglas A-4 that fulfilled the attack role that McDonnell was kind of originally angling for. But around 1955, the design was reworked into an all-weather interceptor for fleet defense. And this obviously was successful. A contract for prototypes was awarded. In 58, testing began. 59 carrier trials. And by the end of 1960, the U.S. Navy had adopted it as the F-4H-1F. That was the original first production version. They only made about 45, 46 of those later we would known as the F-4A. They were never put into combat. They really were more of a pre-production than fully functional. They would just be reserved, kept at home for testing, training, evaluation, well, what have you. But they would give them a slightly improved J-79 engines. We talked about the engines from the 101 Voodoo. This obviously resembles the Voodoo in a lot of ways. The back seater was intended to be the weapons officer operating the radar and what have you, with the front seat being the regular pilot. And uh, with the few improvements of the next version in 1960, the F4H-1, soon to be known as the F4B Phantom II. This would go into service right before the name situation in September of 62, Robert McNamara wanted a unified naming scheme. He also wanted kind of a universal jet to be shared amongst all five branches if possible. And uh, the Phantom had just embarked on its first cruise on the USS Forrestal, also USS Enterprise, in late 61, running into 62, into 63. And so it was just coming in to service, training and whatnot, 
when the Gulf, Gulf, the, the Gulf of Tonkin affair happened in 1964. I'm not getting into the politics and what really happened there part of it. Not the point. The point is this was a new shiny spiffy interceptor in the U.S. Navy at that time. And would go on to definitely make a name for itself. But what about the Marine Corps? This here is uh, a USMC F-4B. Well, the Leathernecks would get their first Phantoms in June of 1962, begin training with them, and start deploying them shortly after the Navy. And they would use them primarily for air defense, sure, sometimes operating off carriers even, but mostly you'd see naval and marines separated with the marines operating from shore bases from airfields on the ground. And Vietnam would be no exception. They would start stationing F-4Bs there in mid-65, around late spring, early summer. And they would start flying combat missions in support of Marines and others on the ground. And they would also do some missions trying to knock down enemy defenses and some combat air patrols. But mostly they were carrying weapons. And while the Navy and Marines both would eventually retire the F-4B, they would stay in service for the majority of the Vietnam War, especially again with the Marines. <clears throat> they would build 649 of this version. And... In total, the Navy and Marines would operate over 1,250 Phantoms, calling uh, you know the the Bs, the Js, the Ss, and so on and so forth. These definitely had an interesting history, and this one here from Holly Master, you might have noticed an interesting armament underneath. That's kind of what got me. Now, to be fair, I did not have just a standard F. 4B in my uh, inventory here on the shelf. I had I had planes that were very similar. I had a couple of um, of the later J's and S's, but yeah, I just felt like I wanted an air to surface, a ground attack version. And then this one is advertised as coming with not one. Not two, but three gun pods. The F4, well, she's big. 63 feet long, 38 and a half feet wingspan, two very powerful J79 engines, and they would get better and better as versions would improve. Essentially, aerodynamics of a brick and it punched its way into the sky and just brute force this was power and i think it's quite a beautiful aircraft myself you can definitely see the influence of the previous 101 voodoo here but also well it has something like the douglas a4 as well it had a total of nine Hard points, nine stations underneath. And it could carry over 18,000 pounds of ordnance, fuel, baggage, whatever. Reconnaissance, ECM equipment, pretty much anything with three hard points being plumbed. But the early B version did not have an internal cannon. That's because at this time it was felt that cannons were on their way out and the new fancy missiles were on the way in. The uh, AIM-7 Sparrow was the primary medium range and uh, the AIM-9B Sidewinder was the short range air to air. But this is a little different. This is a marine attack. Now it does have at the Sparrows on the uh, recess stations. To be fair that's pretty much all you could put there for the most part. The center line 
you could put different things but those uh, semi recessed slots were pretty well dedicated for that and then on the outboard here we've got a couple well three smaller what mark 82s I don't know smaller dumb bombs but the big deal here are these gun pods and this is actually based on one actual unit that custom wired these with three pods and I believe these are mark 4 pods if I'm wrong let me know and if it's a mark 4 it would have contained a mark 11 mod 5 20 millimeter cannon each was 750 rounds for comparison when they would go to the F4E in its internal 20 millimeter cannon it had 640 rounds so that's yeah, well over 2,000 20 millimeter shells and you could fire them all at once assuming you could get them not to jam but yeah little finesse <clears throat> And the idea was ground attack. Now, while three is a bit of an anomaly, there are quite a few photos of Marine Corps planes with two. And you don't always see three tanks or two tanks on these because, again, they're taking off from shore base from a land strip. And, of course, usually they're not having to go near as far. So it's a little bit of fun here, but I think it's neat. I really didn't have a U.S version with uh, a gun pod and it's such an iconic part of the early days of the phantom and i could have put some aim nines on the inboard stations but i thought some bombs would be fun hang on just having fun with it guys i i try to be historically accurate but sometimes i just want to have some fun but yeah they flew quite a few close air support missions between 66 and 68 but we continue to fly them through at least 1970 eventually giving way to the updated versions but the marines would continue to fly the f4 in general including later s models throughout the 80s not really starting to retire them until 90 and the last ones were retired out right after the Gulf War in January of 1992. At least from frontline combat service and what have you. So it had very much a good run with the Marines. And uh, I could see where it would be a good foot for them. A powerful brute force machine that could essentially carry its own weight in bombs and guns. Seems very Marine to me. Of course it also had a radar. Rather advanced for its day and time. In fact, a later version of the Phantom would be the first true look down, shoot down capable jet to go into military service in 1966. But it all started with the B. Even though this is really the first true production combat capable model, it's really quite incredible they stayed in service as long as they did and gave such good service at that. But while the F-4B would actually give way to the J and the S, the other airplane I bore right out actually would stay in active service right up until Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm in 1990. So let's look at the other Marine Phantom. Introduced in 1962, this was originally known as the F-4H-1P for a photo of reconnaissance. But quite soon, just a few months after it was introduced, it would receive the designation of RF-4B. R, of course, for reconnaissance. And as far as I know, at least on mass and in combat, these were only flown by the Marine Corps. Y again, if I'm wrong, uh, please, please let me know. The Marines would... Uh, agree to operate to this version in 1963 and they would uh, soon get the first nine assigned to them begin training in 64 they would become ready in 65 it would start seeing combat in 66 and between that year and 1970 
They would fly mini reconnaissance photo taking missions with these in Vietnam with actually a very good safety record. One of the more survivable ones, if I'm being honest. In fact, they would continue to take delivery of uh, fresh airframes. This would cross from McDonnell to McDonnell Douglas with the last ones. They would build the 46 of the RF-4Bs with the final ones delivered in the later part of 1970. And it's said that the last dozen or so were actually built on rf 4C rather than RF-4B airframes. The C was the Air Force reconnaissance version. These were of course unarmed but they did have electronic jamming. They had uh, various electronic defensive countermeasures. Different pods used over the years. They pretty much relied on their speed of Mach 2 plus and ability, if needed, to climb to quite a high altitude. The Phantom ceiling was roughly 60,000 feet. And these would definitely have uh, external fuel tanks for the missions they would go on. And uh, the difference mostly is here in the nose. It's uh, over four foot longer than a standard F-4B. And it has a somewhat more compact radar and that gives room for a camera bay with three stations. Different cameras could be installed, but essentially you had a forward looking and you had a low level and a high altitude. What was interesting about the cameras in the RF-4B is they could actually be swiveled and directed in flight. So they could be targeted a bit. Other reconnaissance aircraft like the C this couldn't be done in, in flight in the air. Another fun thing is they could actually uh, begin the photo processing in flight and, and drop the canisters behind friendly lines so the intel could get where it needed to go as quick as absolutely possible. They literally didn't even have to wait for the plan to actually land to start uh, looking at the pictures. Um, yeah, the days before digital photography or satellite imaging, but it was advanced for the time. It really was. And the Marines flew these very successfully, mapping out things or confirming destruction or unfortunately showing that something wasn't destroyed during a different uh, mission. Quite interesting. A few different squadrons would fly these, but in 1975, they would actually just consolidate these into one squad. Of course, this is following uh, the Vietnam War. so. After that point, through the 80s, only one Marine squadron flew the RF-4B. And again, the last flights would be in late summer of 1990. And then they would finally retire these. But that, that's a really good run for a reconnaissance aircraft. At this point, it would have been one of the older um, aircraft in the Phantom series still flying. Of course, there would be updates and upgrades to all of these over time. I mean, you, you have to service airframes, but um, typically you didn't see C's flying at this point. <laughs> I think it's neat. I have a soft spot for reconnaissance aircraft, and uh, Hobby Master has always done a very respectable job at building them. The reason actually I got this one is I found it on sale quite a couple of a few years ago. I thought. Well, I don't have a B. I don't have a Marine. So, that's kind of what I had until I found this one. That's why I went ahead and picked it up. Just to give a little Marine set up here. But what do you think? Sorry if it's a little dusty. And there you have it. Again, 172 scale Hobby Master. These are die casts there. Very solid frames. Um, part of the tails are plastic, part are metal. Wings are all metal. The nose is mostly metal till you get past the canopy. The uh, rear is hinged. The front is actually an interchangeable piece. Gear up or down. Ordnance. Pretty standard. 
almost everyone in the diecast game does a phantom and you kind of have to kind of the opposite of the voodoo which really only hobby masters ever done and i do like the rare aircraft but sometimes you just have to go for a classic and if hobby master is going to do something like a phantom i do at least like that they do different versions that's, that's pretty neat you can see the uh distinctive edge there of course the kind of dog tooth edge of the wing pallets inside shorter nose on the B versus the R F here yeah this is the original stand this is the well, not aftermarket, but the extra stand you can get from Hobby Master. I like using these on the Phantoms because you can have the center with, populated with something. Unfortunately, this does kind of take that up. But, um, yeah. Like I said, if you'd like to see more on the Phantoms, let me know. Maybe we can get it done. But, uh, keep kind of working our way through some new aircraft videos as promised. Just thought I'd share something today. With that, this is Misha. Appreciate you hanging out. And we'll catch you very soon next time.